This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. Hi, thanks for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris. And once again, we have as a, our special guest, Jordan Levine. Uh, Jordan is vice president and chief economist for the California Association of Realtors, where he's responsible for the housing market and economic trends and analysis, policy analysis, and data work in a variety of contexts. One critical characteristic that sets Jordan apart from other number crunchers is his ability to communicate complex economic concepts and ideas in a clear and effective style. He has spoken to a variety of groups ranging in size from small groups of five to 10 to over 800, including industry groups like the California Brokers Association and the California State Municipal Financial Officers. Elected officials such as California State Controller's Office, various local government bodies like uh, county boards of supervisors. In addition, he regularly contributes to radio and newspaper articles. Jordan has a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of California in Santa Barbara and a master's degree with merit in international economics from University of Sussex. Prior to joining CAR, Jordan worked as in consulting as an economist and director of economic research where he oversaw all regular and economic analysis on California's economy and housing market and regularly spoke to trade groups, public officials, businesses, and the media. Jordan, welcome back. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I'm sorry we have to have such boring times for, to discuss, huh? <laughs> yeah, really. It's uh, We're just kicking back here at the office every day. So, <laughs> Well, I got to tell you, um, you know, I w- I've always enjoyed hearing you speak. I, I usually, before I interview, I, I watch a presentation of yours, and I, I just want to tell you, your passion comes through, <laughs> and that's, uh, that's a lot of fun to, to see. It really is. Thank you so much. No, yeah, it's a family business going back to the late 70s. My dad was a, a realtor and then he you know, started developing real estate. I always thought that was the direction I was going to go with my career. And then I realized I was more of a, a spreadsheet guy than a people person, but uh, it feels good. And I believe in home ownership and all that stuff. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a great job to have. And I'm, I'm glad that we can add some value. Yeah, one of the, one of the things you mentioned in one of your presentations was just the the net worth effect of owning something Absolutely. in real estate and yeah. i and I, just to touch base on that i would i this was sort of accidental when i saw the latest median price it it hit me and i thought i wonder if that, it's true so between 74 and 80 the median price in california was 34 grand went to 102 a 300 percent right. increase yeah it, in 1996 it kind of went down to another number 180 and went to 540 in 2007. It tripled from there. Yep. And then we went down to 280 in 09. And now we're at 840, which is 300%. We've done it three times. Yeah, exactly. Hey, you know, we've got a really strong economy too. And, and you know, that's one of California's biggest strengths as we continue even after this pandemic and all the shutdowns and things like that. We've started growing faster than the rest of the United States again. And that's something we've done pretty consistently and it sure creates a lot of demand for housing when you've got a really strong economy and that's why you know even though we've had cyclical fluctuations it's you know over the long term it always makes sense to to own a home from the standpoint of of accumulating equity and look it's one of the right you know ways regular people can actually make a leveraged investment too and i think that's one of the things that people forget about is you can get in with only 20 percent of your own money or less right and the bank doesn't come and want to split that equity with you on the back (laughs) end and and if you asked them for a you know 500 or an 840 thousand dollar loan to go buy some bitcoin or something like that a it's not going to happen and b you can be sure that you'd have a you know much bigger pound of flesh at the end of it so one of the problems for california is its prices up there so what percentage of homeowners uh what percentage of families own a home in california we're right about 56 percent. i think it might go down a little bit in the the coming you know quarters just because prices being what they are and affordability what it is and you know it's more than half but we're 
we're running a pretty big gap with the rest of the United States. And I think that's a big challenge for the economy moving forward too, not just for the housing market or for realtors. You know, we're gonna have trouble continuing to be that outperforming number five or whatever economy in the nation if if we can't, you know, get enough workers here to to fill those open jobs. Well, that's what's one of the things that's interesting. When I when I watched your presentation recently, mm -hmm. I didn't realize that we hadn't caught up on our jobs. Yeah, we, we yeah. actually lost more than we have come back. And I didn't know that because the unemployment so low. I right. just thought, how could that be? Yeah. And, and the unemployment's a tricky one because it's a, a ratio. But I think, you know, if you go back to the onset of the pandemic, we lost about 2.8 million jobs and some change thereabouts. And I think we've now added back about 2.3 million and change, maybe a little bit more. I think it's like 2.5 million after the most recent release. So we still got about 300 and some to go to get back towards full recovery. But when you look at the unemployment rate, it's a function not just of the number of jobs that were uh, reporting, but it's also, you know, the denominator there is, is how many people are actually looking for work. And that's one of the things that we really, miss the boat on you know i think that we we kind of assume that once the expanded unemployment benefits and the pandemic unemployment for independent contractors and things like that uh went away that you'd see more folks you know re-enter the labor force and and the labor force participation rate is still depressed as well and i think right. that's you know both why we maybe haven't kind of shot back to that pre-crisis level in terms of the non-farm jobs number. I also think it's one of the big factors that's driving the inflation that we're seeing, you know, because yeah, people we're trying are- Yeah, we're trying to track people off the couch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, for the first time, and I think a, a, a long time, workers feel like they're kind of in the driver's seat and negotiations and things like that. And, and you see that even as the kind of, pandemic related sources of inflation, the supply chain stuff has started to ease, right? We're starting to get more cars on car lots and things like that. And, and the lumber, you know, prices aren't as heinous. We've got the gas stuff, obviously, but a big part is the housing piece and, and the wage inflation, which has been going up and kind of replacing some of those more transitory sources of inflation. And that's why I think you're going to see the Fed continue to be aggressive too. Is, you know, it's not, that's not something that's going to go away overnight. Those folks are going to have to, you know, either max out credit cards or realize that they're, you know, struggling to pay bills or what have you with these prices. And, and I think it's going to be some months before you see that really start to, to bounce back because the, the pandemic, I think, really did change the way that people look at, you know, work and life and where they live and all of that stuff. And I think that that's why there's been this kind of more lasting effect than what we, you know, originally expected. Some of it might be housing too, right? Some of these folks might have cashed in on some equity and are kind of re revisiting their life choices. Yeah, especially since it was tax free gain. It says I'm good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Jordan, of those of those um, jobs that haven't been filled, how many of those are still there though? I mean, there's a lot of businesses that kind of close their doors, right? Yeah. So there's still a big kind of imbalance between, you know, the kind of shape of labor supply and demand, right? You've got a lot of folks in these kind of lower wage sectors. And I think especially with healthcare or, or excuse me, child care being as tight as it is, right? Then it kind of starts to really impact the, the cost benefit of some of those lowest paid workers to go back to, to work. And I think the, the areas that we're growing in are the ones that we've been growing in, the high skill, high tech, and uh, even you know logistics and, and things like that. But those aren't necessarily ones that the, the kind of you know, front desk person at a, at a hotel or at a restaurant or what have you can, can immediately fill. And I think there is that gap there as well. You know, the pandemic really um, set off two groups that seemed to have urgency and it fed any asset boom. So you, it seemed like there was an urgency to feel like, okay, I'm going to get on with what I've always wanted to do. Right. So housing was one of those things, but yep. also uh, yachts were one of those things. Right. So if you, were, if you were in the yacht sale business, you sold more yachts in three months than you did in five years. Right. It was completely nuts. So, but the housing, of course, that was, that's always central to, if so, if you put off housing or if you put off expanding a house, you know, all of a sudden it was on. Counter to that though, there was a group of people that said, okay, I had my house listed, but now I don't want anybody coming through it. 
Right. So your inventory went down by about 45%. Your demand went up like about 35%. And those worlds collided and yep. haven't recovered that balance at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, you, you also got to throw 2.65% mortgage rates into yeah. the mix there, creating that sense of urgency for folks as well. And I think the remote work aspect, right, where folks, like you said, home ownership's always been kind of front and center as part of the American dream, you know, and, and kind of the, the thing that when we do our survey research of consumers, they always say, yeah, I still believe in the American dream. I, I think it means owning my own home, you know, and, and but when you're when you're having to commute to a downtown employment corridor and, and maybe can't afford someplace to live right where you work, that that makes it challenging. And then you have the kind of flexibility piece on top of those low rates and things where, you know, if you don't have to commute to the office every day, then, you know, you can look in places like Sacramento, if you're in the Bay Area, or you can look at places like the Inland Empire, at, you know, if you're in Southern California, and, and you saw a lot of that stuff happening, you saw people go even farther afield than those kind of um, traditional kind of commuter corridors and going to like Tahoe and Big Bear and especially in 2020, there was a lot of that out, you know, opportunistic out migration of these high skilled remote workers and, you know, the fastest growing cities, even though the, the state as a whole grew, I think, it, you know, a couple of percent in terms of transactions in 2020, there was markets out there like those resort markets that were growing by, you know, 40, 50, 100 percent from where they were in 2019. And that was in the middle of a, of a pandemic. And I think you've started to see the shape of that demand normalized back to the major population centers and things like that. But the, the passion for home ownership hasn't, hasn't gone away. And I think that, you know, you just had a, a really kind of strong cocktail of, or recipe for really strong buyer demand when you have that flexibility that, that finally kind of in those low rates that unlock the potential for all these folks who've always wanted home ownership, but maybe just couldn't get it. Um, you know, right off the off the bat where they work. So well, you well, you know, the numbers in 2019. I, that was the one year I looked at and went, "Wow, we got no foreclosures. Yeah, we we only have 400,000 in sales. We barely have any price movement. Yeah, and, and I started thinking, "Wow, is this where we end this cycle? Because everything that you wanted to have a positive upside, sure. the employment numbers and all that would normally have created 10 to 15 percent price increase, and it created almost nothing." Right. And and I thought, and maybe this was true, that there was just a lackadaisical, I don't really care if I own now. There was definitely, um, you know, when I was a young adult, man, that's all I could think of. I got to yeah. go from renter to owner uh, tomorrow. Right. And uh, my son, Aaron, is, you know, in that age group where his friends are sort of like 35 to 40, you know, a few years ago. And eh, <laughs> they didn't care. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's it's kind of rekindled that because folks want to be able to just have their own space and you need, you know, we're, we're asking our homes to just check so many more boxes for us. It started to subside now, but we saw the median square footage on a home that, that owner occupants were buying jump up by about 120 square feet, which to my mind, that's a, you know, that's a home office right there, your 10 by 12 room with uh -huh. the all of that stuff. And and so I think that that is is really part of it. I also think the cost has not been a picnic. You know, we we kind of give folks a hard time in the younger age categories and things like that. But I mean, when you look at the affordability numbers or you talked about, you know, the late 70s, early 80s in California, when we we're talking about 30 to 40, you know, thousand dollar home prices, I always joke, you know, my my dad literally walked around in the early 80s. I remember like bragging about his 12 and a half percent. <laughs> mortgage rate and you know he was lucky just to get a fixed rate mortgage and one at 12 and a half percent was an absolute steal i think he later refied it like 10 years down the road to like you know nine percent or something and that was like a screaming deal too but the thing he wasn't grappling with though is a eight hundred and fifty thousand dollar median price which is effectively where we're at um, now so even though it's kind of you know, it's it's easy to joke about how low rates are and just going from three to five percent, people really freak out. Um, you know, I'm through the lens of like my dad's era, that's nothing, right? And we the market's done fine with five and six percent rates, even going back to 2005 and six, that wasn't sabotaging the market, but it does have an outsized impact when you lay it on top of these really extreme price levels, you know, and, and so that is kind of a 
it's going to be a headwind for housing demand moving forward because even with that flexibility and insatiable appetite, I mean, I, I went back to East County, San Diego and did a speech the other day in that town I grew up in, which was just a solidly blue collar area. You know, it wasn't a fancy part of San Diego County. It was about 35 minutes to go to the beach for us, you know, but but the median price out there is like 745,000 now. And and so, um, you know, that not not everybody can absorb these these rate increases. And, and I think that eventually that that will catch up to the market. We're still seeing strong numbers now. And I think that urgency is there for folks who are like, yeah, let's get in before it gets to 6% and what have you. But yeah, it's going to start to die down, I think, as we get to the second half. There's a couple uh, psychological plays that'll start to happen. You'll have people that didn't get in when it was three or four do exactly what you just said. Right. But on the other side, you've also got people that have the twos and the threes going, I'm good and I'm not going anywhere. And yeah. that home may not come on the market ever. Yeah, no, I think, you know, it, it, it could become the new kind of Prop 13 in a way, right? We've gotten the tax portability now where you can move and you don't take that property tax hit with you if you want to retire or what have you. But if you've got a mortgage outstanding and you're sitting on a two and a half percent, you know, fixed rate, then that's a, a big disincentive to go somewhere else. Even if you've got a boatload of equity, if you're taking out any money at all and it's, a, you know, twice the, the borrowing costs, that's significant. On the other hand, you might get over the short run, some folks who, you know, if you're thinking about moving in the next couple of years, that it might make sense to do it sooner than later. So you get in at a lower rate now before, you know, before they go any, any higher. So I, I again, I think that will help over the short run. I think over the long term, it's going to be a big challenge. I think we got to look on the policy front, at like assumable loans again, right? There you go. Oh, I just was going to bring that up. We went, we were invited to Washington, D.C. to meet with uh, the CEO of Fannie Mae. And that was the subject I brought up. Yeah, I said, if you do not allow these loans to go forward to a new buyer, you're going to have a really a, buff, a by, bifurcated market where you're going to have affordability at one level for the people that are already in, yeah. but you're going to have a whole different price point because the payment's probably not going to change that they can afford. So it'll right. be a different price level. Yeah. But, you know, so that was really the discussion is how do you get all this big pack of loans to move forward? Because realtors have to make a living too. Yeah. What was yeah. what was really interesting in 1980 and 81, you know, the volume of sales went down a lot, but 50% of the sales that existed did not need a new loan. Right. That was really unusual. Yeah, and it's huge. I mean, if you could just take out a second for whatever the overhang is, right, the, that that balance that you need and you do that at, at market rates, I mean, you know, it also creates just not just the supply challenge because, you know, those units don't don't hit the market, but then we've got just a totally mismatched allocation of the units, right, where you've got people staying in homes that don't even work for them, right, that they don't even want all this space and things like that. And so, you know, even the housing stock that we that we have forget about new development and all of that stuff you know it's just it's so inefficiently allocated that it creates all these you know kind of unintended consequences too you got new you know families with four kids and they want that that house with all the rooms and stuff and and you know you got the folks who want to retire and are sick of walking up and down stairs and all of that but you can't just kind of more efficiently allocate that because there's all these kind of um you know I, well, that, I almost call them policy oriented, you know, kind of structural things that are keeping folks in place when they don't want to. Yeah, that'd be really interesting to see if they could get to the bottom of that. Yeah, because, you know, somebody in control should really make a decision and say, you know what, we used to do this. And for right now, we better do it again. Right. And I mean, these are still presumably credit worthy borrowers, right? We're not talking about yeah. lower and underwriting standards and doing all of that stuff. I mean, they're still worthy of 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 carrying those loans and things like that so to me it's just a no a no-brainer to help keep the market moving and you know especially when supply is the big challenge for home ownership and stuff you want you know what if people want to sell we should be encouraging them to be able to do that you shouldn't have to be penalized for you know moving to a better property or what have you. right um what percentage of the of the market is first-time buyers in california We've had an elevated percentage. We haven't done our, our 2022 annual housing market survey quite yet, but last mm -hmm. year's number, we were still above a third and the year before that, it was almost 
forty percent of the market. I think it was thirty-seven and change as a percentage of of transactions. And actually, I think that's why we did see the home ownership rate go up, even in the midst of this pandemic. A little bit. We're still, you know, only at fifty-six percent, but. Um, it, you know, we, we did see a lot of folks finally take that leap into home ownership for the first time, even with a market that hasn't fully, or, you know, an economy that hasn't fully recovered yet, things like that, which I think is just a testament to this, this kind of renewed passion for home ownership. Do you see the rate increases most adversely affecting the new person that will try to get in? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, we, we have an affordability challenge for, for folks just in terms of the price levels and where incomes are at. And so, you know, they're, they were already kind of um, scrapping their way into the housing market, as it were. And I think this only makes it more difficult. The good news, I think, you know, and why we're not predicting the market's going to collapse it at five and a half percent or whatever is because we still have a lot of high income earners, right? So there's still that kind of um, lower bound to housing demand. We've got a lot of folks that are in great jobs making multiple six figure incomes who are the ones who are going to continue to, you know, demand housing. And there's where that structural imbalance comes from. But at the margins, right, for those folks who are just, you know, really struggling to qualify. And one of the ways I always present it is, is kind of probably the wrong way. But, you know, if, if you just take that projected median priced home this year of about 835000 or so, and, and look at what the payment is on that at 3% and then what the payment is on it at 5%, it's an $800 difference more or less per month, right? And so, um, you know, that's, that's real money for, for California households, even though our median income's now up to almost $80,000 a year, not everybody can afford, you know, another 10 grand worth of post-tax income. And, and so that's, you know, going to hit the people who are just right up against it the hardest if you're making 400 grand a year, you know, but but the reality is instead of raising your payment by 800 bucks, because most people can't afford it, what it means is that you have to look for a home at a lower price point, right, by like 120 grand and finding affordable inventories like our number one challenge in the state. And so those are the folks who are probably going to, you know, be up against it. The, the last calculation on the car website for affordability, I think, was 23. Yeah. But that was before the rate increases. So I would assume that you're probably at something like, like 17 or so. Right. And, you know, it, it's also because we're in a seasonal lull for home prices. So that's just our raw median home price. We haven't seasonally adjusted that. And so when we get into the summer peak price months and you layer on top the higher rates, we have a little bit higher rates. I think it was a 3.97 that we fed into that calculation based on the first quarter rate, but that includes the like 3% number that we have to start the year. So when we get into Q2, we're going to both have that kind of price appreciation that's going to be in that, you know, really high seasonal time for prices and the higher rate that's closer to 5%. And that will be the one-two punch for, for the affordability number. You have a comment on your presentation, affordability inversely is inversely proportional to supply. So what did you yeah. mean by that? Yeah, the less supply we have, you know, it's, it's, we've functionally kind of commoditize the housing market, right? And so we have housing that's just going to the highest bidder. And that's that's because we both have, you know, kind of all that buyer demand that we talked about. There's just a longstanding structural challenge. We've gone from, you know, 10 to 15 or, you know, 17 million non-farm jobs. The population's grown by 15 million people over the last three decades or so. And and we just have not, we actually build about a third as much as we used to back yeah. in the eight. We don't just build, you know, not more or only a little bit more. We actually build a lot less, even with well, more population and more jobs. Yeah, a lot less. And, what, and so then you got all these high income people out there, you know, kind of really thirsting after these homes that aren't available. And so that, you know, you don't, you anybody who's gone to a popular concert knows that the more, you know, more people that want to get in and the fewer tickets they have, then the higher those ticket prices go. And that's kind of where we're at with housing. Do you have a historical perspective of where affordability hits a breaking point? Last time we got into the low teens. So we were at, I think, 12% housing affordability at the height of the last housing cycle. Right. Um, and, and prices did come down significantly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot. 
Yeah. Well, that and, was that was only reached because you had a fraudulent loan in industry completely. Yeah, we've got about a you know if you just look at the raw median price to median income number, it's ten though you know, and so it's, it's, it's only been there since oh, that that was the peak at 06. And that was the peak in 06. Now you got to shave some of that down because rates aren't six percent the way that they were back then, but they're getting there. And and so I think that you know they're even at the end of 2020, you could largely explain that 715, dollars $720,000 median price by fundamentals. You could look at where rates were, you could look at where income was, you could look at just general inflation in the economy over the last couple of decades, and you could get to a number that was pretty close to the number that we actually were seeing. But in 2021, it re-accelerated into the you know double digits and, and really broke away from those fundamentals. And so there's this kind of excess demand component to the price growth. And it's not the kind of scary um, systemic risk kind of demand, right? But we're still underwriting loans to an incredibly high standard FICO rates and things like that. But I am starting to see more, you know, just kind of spam emails like get a no doc loan and things like that. But I think that's very small looking back over the last couple of years. But but still, I think that there has been a decoupling of these prices over the last year from, from fundamentals. And even though we have much more sound fundamentals and people have skin in the game and they borrowed, you know, on a kind of healthy level relative to debt to incomes and all that stuff. If the financial markets tank and as we're recording this, I think we're in the middle of another sell off day. It's been a bad couple of days, but I think we are, you know, even though housing's not going to be ground zero and we don't have all this bad lending and things like that. I, I do think we're now susceptible to just if, if you know, the economy bigger external shock because prices have gotten a bit ahead of themselves okay um i view i view the affordability chart really is an important uh chart but we've had different outcomes so 1980 you're at 17 percent affordability you've got 10 percent unemployment you got 22 months of inventory right. for sale and you have no price damage in the next three years yeah and then you go to um like 2007 and 2009, you get to 12% affordability right. and you, you have much less inventory and you get crushed. So what, what saved the eighties from not having a downturn because that that's really a head scratcher. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, there's, there's kind of not every recession leads in just in general, not even in the eighties, but to, to price declines, right? We had like the dot-com bubble that yeah. popped in early 2002 and we didn't see a lot of movement downward in prices there either i think the 80s is unique because it's you know kind of a high inflation time and and you know that's that's kind of one of the things i think real estate still has going forward is that when in, in times of inflation right owning dirt having something solid and tangible like real estate is is attractive right that's why you want gold bars in your safe downstairs and all all that stuff in times of, of inflation. So I think there's that component to it, right? Where, where you know, it, it is kind of a, a, it's a safe haven for, for inflation. I also think that, you know, again, we've got a big, if you look at the later ones, especially the 2001 and, you know, even the 90s prices went down a bit. That was a huge structural change to our, our economy, right? Where we, you know, the Cold War ended and we had the loss of aerospace and defense and we just weren't building a lot of that military stuff. And that was a fundamental knock. And that's why, you know, you did get some because it was a restructuring of the economy. I would argue the same thing in 2005, six, this, you know, and that's why I said it's a, still a long-term, a great time to own a home, because even if we do get cyclical changes or a big shock to the economy, there's still that fundamental, you know, 15 million extra people that live here now with not enough housing units for them. That means that, you know, the, the kind of medium term outlook for prices in California is always for them to be higher. What's interesting, you know, now we have inflation for the first time since the 70s. So right. the 70s, 74 to 80, prices in real estate tripled when interest rates doubled. So, you know, that just saying that sentence, yeah. I hear, I usually hear a lot of, uh, and I've debated some economists that say, well, of course, when interest rates go up, prices go down and you go, wow, you know, you got to look at a chart because that's, uh, that isn't always true. Yeah. But I will, but I will say that right now, let's say it, we're at five and a quarter percent interest rate and we're at 17%. 
we're actually matching the affordability we got to in 80 and 89. Yeah. So how do you think this plays out for other charts? So affordability to me tips over other charts in a negative way. Yeah. So definitely. we may, okay. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's going to show up in the sales numbers first. I think the first place you'll see it, though, is in the competitiveness, right, of the market. Right now, we're seeing about still, I think, even through last week, I haven't updated the stuff through the weekend yet, but last week, we were still seeing 70% of closed transactions close above asking price. They're still going pending in, you know, about 10, 11 days on average across the state, and I think that's where you'll see it first, right, is that you won't have, like, some people will get priced out of the margin and at the margins, and, and so those folks who are still in it won't have to, you know, go as high above asking. They might start asking for concessions again, right? You, you might see uh, more inventory come onto the market, and homes are going to stay on the market a little bit longer, and as that happens, right, and as, as people aren't as kind of having to scrabble tooth and nail to get their offer accepted because there's there's just less people submitting offers then I think you'll see hopefully price growth you know slow without going negative that for me you know you want that proverbial soft landing where prices go up by a couple percent a year right but we give folks time for incomes to catch up and to start to close that gap on on affordability you want incomes to kind of outpace prices for a number of years and and I think that's the kind of best case you know, scenario that we could hope for. Hey, that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Norse Group Real Estate Radio Show and Podcast. Please be sure to catch us next week for part two of our interview with California Association of Realtors Chief Economist, Jordan Levine. For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com. The Norris Group originates and services loans in California and Florida under California DRE License 01219911, Florida Mortgage Lender License 1577, and NMLS License 1623669. For more information on hard money lending, go to thenorrisgroup.com and click the hard money tab.